right. So, that is 4 by 3 pi a b c divided by 2 pi by l the whole cube. And what are a b and c? Many of you have taken a b and c as k x k y k z. How can that be? Because k x k y k z are the respective coordinate in the x y and z axis. Whereas, a b c re re refer to the, the maximum lengths in the corresponding um, uh, you know coordinates. So, for that you have to put the given equation right, the given dispersion relation in terms of that uh, ellipse equation, you understand. So, x square by a square plus y square by b square plus z square by c square equal to 1 of that form, then you will get what is a, b and c and once you write uh, your number of states as a function of this, so directly you will have this in terms of energy. So, all you have to do is differentiate this with respect to energy, so that will give you dn by dE. So, it becomes very easy to work out. Once you get n as a function of E, directly you find dn by dE divided by L cube and you will get your density of states. So, always the density of states we express in terms of energy, not in terms of k. Okay. So, that I think was a slightly tricky problem you are, um, I gave you a hint also, I think you should have thought about it. So, apart from that uh, most of you could solve the other three, other three problems related to the Boltzmann transport equation and quantum, quantum dot, so, this, so those were all fine. And many of you used uh, in the third problem the, the atomic weight of oxygen. So, I have asked you to calculate everything for a molecule. So, many of you took atomic weight as 16 and you have calculated mean free path and other things. So, there you got wrong. I think the second problem was the little bit more trickier one. So, the approach is quite different from what we have attempted in class. So, I wanted to see how many of you can uh, do that this is slightly out of the box thinking because the other ones are more or less uh, you know being taught especially the fourth problem right and you already know the first problem how it should come out the answer should come out so many of you have not really attempted to apply the boundary condition and show that uh, I mean these are how the quantum numbers turn turn out to be uh, but you have anyway deduced that this should be the right answer, so therefore you got it n pi by L and n L m and n, okay. But where you went wrong, the thinking was required was to calculate the degeneracy of the first four energy levels, okay. So many of you <laughs> have just used uh, L equal to 0, 0, 1, 1, you know, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 like that. So, how can quantum numbers be 0 in the case of quantum dot, in the case of uh, uh, the confinement? If your quantum number is 0, there is no wave function. That means, there is no particle inside the box, okay, which does not make sense. So, there is definitely a particle. We do not know only where it is uh, inside the box, what is the exact location. That also, if you calculate based on the wave function, it turns out to be middle of the box, most likely probability. Okay, but uh, the degeneracy part was a tricky one. Also, uh, you are supposed to know what are the values of energy first. So, if you substitute one one one, okay, you know that that is the lowest value of energy. And then now the next uh, question comes. So you have one two one, one one two, two one one. For this, you have the next higher value of energy. Okay. So, after after this what is the third level? 1, 2, 2. Okay. I think many of you have gone to 3 by that time. By the third or fourth energy level you have already gone to 3. Even before going to 3, so you will get different uh, values of energy which is higher than the previous one. So, that is what you have to say. First four energy levels is first four consecutive values of progressive values of increasing energy and their corresponding degeneracy. 
okay. So these are things which uh, require little bit different thinking from what you have done also in the assignment. So in the open notes examination, so generally uh, you are tested for problems which is slightly different from the approach we take in the class because you do not have to memorize anything for sure. So therefore the emphasis is on thinking little bit different okay, and make sure that we test your understanding thoroughly. So anyway, so now um, in the remaining uh, we have about uh, 10 classes or so, right. We have another uh, 3 to 4 weeks, right. And um, so what we will do is uh, uh, look at the different uh, uh, forms of the micro scale energy transport. So we have in the last uh, couple of classes we talked about the, the nano scale or micro scale gas flows, okay, a gas flows in mini and micro channels. So in that case uh, we talked about the slip boundary conditions and then solved uh, um, a few examples for, for which analytical solution can be determined to get the velocity profiles and similarly temperature profiles, okay. So, so therefore, uh, so that, that in that case you are thinking whether a proper continuum can be used, if uh, continuum equations can be used in the bulk uh, transport, so what about near wall? So in the near wall we talked about the velocity and temperature jump conditions, okay, the which were given by the Maxwell's velocity profile as well as the Smoluchowski's temperature jump condition. And Whereas if you are talking about Knudsen numbers higher than 0.1, okay. So in that case even the continuum equations were questioned and then we saw how the Burnett equations can be used, okay, which, which are obtained as the higher order approximations of the Boltzmann transport equation, okay. So you have Knudsen number power 0, Knudsen number power 1, Knudsen number square and so on. So Knudsen number power 0 term will give you the Euler equation. Knudsen number to the power 1, first two terms now will give you the Navier-Stokes Then, if you include the third term it will give you the Burnett equation and so on. So therefore in all these cases the, the viscous stress tensor and heat flux vector, so all of these become increasingly more and more complicated, correct. So the computational effort also becomes uh, difficult. So therefore higher Knudsen numbers for gas flows involve solving therefore not, uh, different from the Navier-Stokes equations, the Burnett equations and again um, for the more practical cases we try to retain continuum equations with the modifications in the slip. So the basic slip are the Maxwell's and Smoluchowski slip but you can also extend that to second order slip okay to in order to retain the continuum equation. So most, most of the uh, practical studies have been using this kind of an approach. The next thing now we will do is go on to the liquid phase, the, the liquid flows, but in liquid flows you have now different kinds of problems. So you can talk about single phase, so this is the first um, introductory part of the liquid flows. So that means uh, you are talking about only one phase which is pure liquid. And again uh, when you talk about liquid flows the equations are not uh, now that interesting or that difficult compared to the gas flows, okay. So you will be still talking about the continuum equations and the boundary conditions also are not a problem because most of the time your Knudsen numbers are much lesser than 0 0.01. So therefore there is no problem with applying the no slip boundary condition. And only the, um, uh, the interesting uh, issue will be the different kinds of uh, the flow physics that come out at mini and micro scales, okay, which are different from the macro scale problem. So what we will do is we will anyway know the conventional macro scale liquid flow transport equation. Uh, we will try to apply this to micro scale and identify what are the important physics that come out in the micro scale and give emphasis only on that, okay. So 
you know that you know most of the uh, momentum and energy equations that that are generally <coughs> applicable to the macro macro scale that is the navier stokes can be applied to the micro channels with liquid flow so that is probably the easier thing um, but what is uh, probably um, more interesting is two things one is the effect of uh, the relative roughness so when you have talk about a micro channel which is uh, of the size of few hundred microns so there now the effect of the roughness of the walls which can be a few tens of microns can become significant so this can lead to different issues so one is the transition from laminar to turbulent okay so the the relative roughness effects not only affects the basic friction factor and heat transfer coefficient but also the transition um, um, is quite different in the micro scale micro channels because of uh, the relative um, the effect of the relative roughness at the walls okay so therefore what is more challenging is and what is interesting is also that you have certain empirical correlations for friction factor nusselt number for the macro channels you want to verify whether this can be applied at the micro scale directly okay so if not what is the additional modification that has to be brought in so if everything is similar from macro scale there is nothing challenging at micro scale so the same correlations can be applied so the same physics so there is nothing interesting so but definitely there are things which are distinct at micro scale and we have to investigate therefore whether these correlations can be modified and applied suitably for the liquid flow in micro and mini channels so most of the cases you know 99% of the cases you don't have any problem with facing higher knudsen numbers so you have a perfect assumption of continuum and newtonian flow and also no problem with jumps for velocity and temperature at the walls okay so therefore you can assume if you for example take the case of flow through a, a smooth uh, circular tube without any roughness effects whether it is macro scale or micro scale now it is not going to make any difference a perfectly smooth wall uh, will have the same uh, value of uh, friction factor and nusselt number irrespective of whether this is a channel of few centimeters diameter or few microns diameter so already you know that for the case of uh, single phase uh, flows in macro channels so if you talk about uh, fully developed flows in either tubes or channels so you simply apply the um, balance of forces so one is the pressure gradient along the x direction if you take x as the axial direction the other is the wall shear stress right so even if you write down the navier stokes equation and simplify that you end up with only the viscous diffusion in the vertical direction the other is your <coughs> pressure gradient along the axial direction right so these two will be balancing each other and from that you can integrate and calculate what are the velocity profiles right and from which you can calculate the relation between the center line velocity profile the mean velocity profile and you can calculate additional quantities integral quantities like friction factor okay so all these are known you know so these are coming from simply micro scale fluid <coughs> mechanics there's nothing different here except you should know that uh, we have two different friction factors right so one um, is defined based on the wall shear stress and that is called the fanning friction factor so that is tau wall divided by half rho u square right so that is your fanning friction factor the other is your darcy friction factor so we define darcy friction factor in terms of the pressure gradient okay if you say dp by dx so dp by dx times the diameter divided by half rho u m square so that is your darcy friction factor so and your fanning and darcy friction factor are 
related such a way that your Darcy friction factor is 4 times the fanning friction factor. So, generally if you therefore, derive a relation for the fanning friction factor for a circular cross section, what is the relation you get? 16 by Re, okay. therefore the Darcy friction factor will be 64 by Re. Okay. So, this is this is uh, you know something that is already known to you, but I want to again highlight the difference uh, because most of the time in these correlations that I will be talking about, we will be mostly using the fanning, fanning friction factor. Okay. So, um, apart from that, um, you also know that if you have a non-circular uh, cross section then instead of using the regular diameter of the channel, you replace this with the hydraulic diameter which is defined as 4 times cross sectional area by perimeter. Okay. So, these are things which you already know and then you go ahead and you calculate your expression for friction factor. Okay. Now, depending on again whether it is a fanning or Darcy this Poiseuille number will be different. So, the Poiseuille number is nothing but the product of friction factor times Reynolds number. So, which is a constant for most of the fully developed duct flows and depending on the duct cross sectional area, you have different values of Poiseuille number. Okay. And this Poiseuille number also depends on the aspect ratio if it is a rectangular duct. Okay. So, therefore, um, you know, so you can simply write down expressions for Poiseuille number and depending on whether you use fanning or Darcy friction factor again um, this can be different. For example, we, since we are talking about fanning friction factor here for the circular pipe the Poiseuille number will be 16. Okay. So, now if you have a rectangular channel with uh, sides A and B. So, if, if you for example, consider a rectangular channel as shown in this particular figure, uh, where uh, you have the shorter side as A and the longer side as B. So, you can define the ratio of uh, A by B. Okay. So, your aspect ratio is B by A, but you can define a parameter uh, alpha C, which is the ratio of A by B, the shorter side length divided by the longer side length. So, if you calculate A by B, uh, there is one uh, popular correlation given by uh, Shaw and London. So, from which we can determine the Poiseuille number for any aspect ratio. Okay. So, for uh, any rectangular cross sectional area for different values of A by B, we can calculate the corresponding Poiseuille number. Okay. So, uh, as you can see that uh, um, for different cross sectional shapes, duct shapes. So, you have different values of Poiseuille number. Uh, for the rectangular case, you can use this particular Shaw and London's correlation to get this value and they have been tabulated here. Um, so, out of this uh, you can see by varying the aspect ratio, you know. So, if you increase the aspect ratio, you see that the Poiseuille number increases and at the same time you are heat transfer coefficient also increases. So, the nusselt number H and T. So, that, in, that means that nusselt number for constant heat flux boundary condition, nusselt number for constant wall temperature boundary condition. So, the nusselt number for the constant uh, heat flux boundary condition is usually higher than the constant wall temperature condition and with uh, for a case of a rectangular channel with increasing aspect ratio you see that the values of nusselt number increases and so does the value of the Poiseuille number. And again for other shapes such as the hexagon, triangle, ellipse also they have been calculated although they are not very common shapes. So, especially um, um, shapes like hexagon or triangle is not so commonly used in uh, heat exchangers. Right? So, all this is the knowledge coming from macro macro channel okay and the same thing can be applied if you have a smooth micro channel also the other thing that is important is what is called the developing length hydrodynamic developing length and this hydrodynamic developing length can be 
estimated for uh, macro channels uh, as 0 0.05 times Reynolds number. Okay. So, for example, if your Reynolds number is equal to 100, so this value will be 5. So, this is a non dimensional um, length at which the boundary layers will merge and then after which you do not have any change in the velocity profile. So, therefore, you, you say d u by d x is 0 beyond this particular length. So, less than this you have all the gradients in the axial direction also they are very important you cannot neglect them and that becomes a very complex uh, region. You have to solve the Navier-Stokes uh, equation considering the inertial terms also you cannot neglect the inertial terms in the developing region. So, now what is uh, now different about the, um, the, the micro channel case for example. So, usually as you, as you see that one of the effects of keeping the channel diameters small for the same value of uh, Poiseuil number. Okay. So, that means you have a friction factor which is constant say if you are operating at Reynolds number of 100. Okay and you reduce your channel diameter from say 1 mm to 1 micron. So, 3 orders of magnitude. So, what happens to the pressure drop? It increases by 3 orders of magnitude. Okay. So, keeping um, your uh, friction factor the same, you see that your pressure drop increases in a several orders of magnitude when you go from macro to micro channel. So, therefore, since you are um, dp by therefore, pressure drop is large you do not want to have long channels when you have micro channel because then you have to put lot of pumping power to overcome this pressure drop. right? So, therefore, typically all the micro channels have uh, relatively much smaller lengths compared to the macro channels and therefore, uh, most of the times you will have a considerable length of this channel to be developing. Okay. So, in the case of large uh, long channels you can always neglect this developing length to be very small. For example, if your Reynolds number is 100, if your L by D is 5 okay, and if your diameter is of the order of uh, 100 microns okay, and your length is of the order of several centimeters, then you can safely ignore the developing length. But if your length is of the order of few millimeters, Okay, then this becomes a very important uh, contribution. So, therefore, you can say that what is different now in the micro channel case one possible uh, thing is that the effect of the developing region will become more important in the, mic in the micro channel compared to the macro channel. And again when you are therefore, talking about the pressure drop could be a micro or macro, but where the developing effects are significant, we have to now modify the earlier formulation what we use as f with what is called as f apparent. Okay. So, why apparent means we, we are now no, not just talking about fully developed region, but also a region which is developing and therefore, the total pressure drop should account for both these regions, a part of which it, it is developing and a part which is developed. For the developed case we know what is the Poiseuille number, okay. it is a, a constant value for a given cross sectional area whereas, for the developing region. So, you have to write down some empirical correlations to determine this and therefore, in general um, for the case where you consider the developing and the developed region you replace this f with what is called as f apparent this has two components one accounts for pressure drop uh, which is for a fully developed flow, the other is the developing effects. Okay. So, therefore, how do we calculate this f apparent is the next question. Okay. So, one of the ways to do the common way is to define um, what is called as an incremental pressure. Okay. So, this incremental pressure is uh, denoted by notation k and you know this is a function of x because if you are probably within the developing region itself okay this incremental pressure will be a function of x if you are outside 
the developing region this incremental pressure will become a constant value okay. So therefore k is a function of x is uh, defined as the difference between the apparent friction factor and the fully developed friction factor okay. So this gives you the local variation of the friction factor in the developing region you understand. So the difference between the apparent and the fully developed one should give you what is the friction factor in the developing region and this is varying locally. So that is why your incremental pressure is a function of x. Now for x greater than the developing length, so then this value would become a constant because beyond this there is no variation in the friction factor with respect to position, it is a constant value. So for this entire region uh, of x is equal to LH, your value of k uh, reaches a constant value which is denoted by k infinity and this is called the Hagenbach's factor. So the Hagenbach's factor is a limiting value of the incremental pressure when your uh, x reaches the developing length. So beyond which this be becomes a constant value, right. So most of the cases uh, you know so once you talk about uh, uh, you know a position where uh, which is uh, greater than the developing length you do not have to worry about k of x but directly k infinity you can substitute and then you can calculate your apparent friction factor. So therefore the overall pressure drop which is now defined in terms of f apparent so you can rewrite the previous uh, expression which is in terms of rho u m square x by d in terms of Reynolds number okay. So you can uh, multiply and divide by for example d okay and then you can write this in terms of Reynolds number. So this turns out to be uh, 2 times f app r e into mu u m x by d h square and this f app now from this definition of incremental pressure you can split it into two terms one which corresponds to the fully developed region the other is your developing region okay. So therefore you write it in terms of two terms and if you are considering uh, length of x which is greater than LH this k of x will become k infinity which is your Hagenbach factor. So to, to in order to calculate uh, this particular uh, Hagenbach factor the this common expression uh, which is used is by Steinke and Kandlikar. So they have uh, for, for a rectangular channel for example they have obtained an empirical correlation to calculate k infinity as a function of the um, a by b, a by b ratios. So this is the most commonly used uh, expression for rectangular channels. So you can based on this you can calculate k infinity and then you can substitute into this you already know your expression for friction factor coming from the previous section because the Poiseuille number is also a function of the a ratio of a by b. So you know therefore what is your fully developed friction factor now you know your Hagenbach factor. So corresponding to some x which is greater than LH you can therefore calculate what is your delta P okay. So for the entire uh, pipe so you can therefore replace your x with the length of the pipe. So this, uh, this, is, this is what is now going to be different in the micro channel case. In the macro channel case uh, many a time you will be ignoring the Hagenbach factor you just uh, knock out the second term and only calculate delta P from the first term but for micro channels you should also include this second term this becomes quite important. There are also some other um, standard um, correlations to get the overall uh, pressure drop as a function of only x without bothering this separate contributions of fully developed flow and Hagenbach factor. So one such correlation um, looks like this it is a function of x non dimensional x which is your x by d by re. So if you sim simply substitute your non dimensional x you get your value of uh, non dimensional pressure drop okay. So 
here uh, already the effect of uh, the Hagenbach's factor is implicitly there. Okay. So, these are all uh, empirical correlations from different experiments. Right. So, and these are applicable equally for both macro and micro channels, does not matter, only that the effect of developing length since they become more significant at for micro channels, so this has to be rigorously followed. So, if you plot uh, this uh, f apparent that you are calculating here based on your f and Hagenbach's factor and you plot it as a function of the local x plus, this may be something of this particular form. So, you find that uh, for values of, so the x goes from the right to left here, the smallest value is on the right and then it increases towards the left. So, in the developing region, so that is in this particular region, this is where you find there is a lot of difference between uh, the different aspect ratios. So, for different aspect ratios, your value of k will become quite different and in the developing region is where this parameter will become important compared, compared to this particular factor. So, therefore, the effect of uh, the aspect ratios become more significant in the developing region, but after you go deeper, so for values of x greater than larger than your L d developing length, so the effect of um, the uh, Hagenbach factor becomes smaller and smaller and your fully developed friction factor becomes the most important contributor and all these different um, aspect ratios will collapse into a single line. So, this is how the plot uh, looks. Okay. So, similarly, so all this discussion we had are for laminar flows. So, what happens uh, when the flow becomes turbulent okay. and in that case um, how these correlations become different. So, for, for, for the generic case um, for turbulent flows, uh, one of these um, often used correlation is developed is given by Blasius uh, which is given like this f is equal to 0 0.0791 r e power minus 0.25. So, this is the simplest uh, correlation for estimating the friction factor. Now, um, there has been modification for the case where you have both developing and developed regions. So, there is one person Phillips who developed an expression for um, the turbulent flows where you have both the developing and developed regions to be accounted. So, in that case he has modified the correlation so that the f apparent can be directly calculated as a function of um, R e. So, this R e is anyway fixed, but the parameters which are changing are the uh, values a and b. So, these a and b uh, parameters are functions of the non-dimensional position. Okay. So, based on the non-dimensional position x by d, you can substitute into this expression. This is again another empirical correlation developed by Phillips. Uh, you can get the value directly for the f apparent. So, here you do not have to worry about adding separately the Hagenbach factor. Okay. So, again uh, um, for uh, case of rectangular geometries, you know you can uh, use a slightly modified definition of Reynolds number. So, you can um, just uh, plug it directly into this expression and get the apparent friction fact, fact. Okay. So, so, overall uh, you know the, the discussion is that whatever um, correlations have been developed for macro channels so far is now used as it is for micro channel, only thing that we give more importance to the developing region. right? So, whether it is laminar or turbulent does not matter. So, now what is, what are the other additional effects which become significant for liquid flows in micro channels. So, now that we know that within the channel itself you have to account for the developing region and you have to therefore, use the appropriate correlations depending on whether they are laminar or turbulent. And not only that most of these micro channels are fed by me means of manifolds. Okay. So, you do not usually have just a single micro channel, but several times you have a parallel system of micro channels. Okay. These are 
small diameter channels. So, therefore, in order to cover a particular surface, you want to use many numbers of these channels. Okay. It could be 5, 10, 20, 100. So, there could be several, several of these channels uh, stacked parallelly and in that case, you have to have a feeder mechanism which supplies the liquid to all these channels and at the end of the channels, they collect the liquid and then take them out. So, these are, this can be referred to as the manifolds, inlet and outlet manifold or inlet and outlet plenum. So, this is similar to any heat exchanger, in any, any, any heat exchanger you supply uh, the liquid through a manifold and distribute it to so many tubes of the heat exchanger and then collect it in an outlet manifold and take them out. So, in this particular case, so as it is illustrated, you can see that uh, if you measure the pressure drop between the inlet and outlet manifold. So, this is how your pressure tappings are and you connect it to a differential pressure transmitter and you try to measure the pressure drop. So, this gives you the overall pressure drop of the micro channel. So, you do not exactly put a pressure trapping here and here, you want to measure the overall pressure drop from the inlet of the manifold to the exit manifold because the pumping power required is to overcome this overall pressure drop. So, in this case apart from the developing region and frictional losses, you also have two other losses which are coming into picture. One is the ent entrance losses, the other is your exit losses. So, in the entrance you also see that the flow has to turn 90 degrees. So, you also have additionally bend losses. So, therefore, three other factors contribute to the overall pressure drop if you take from here to here. So, the other, the other two apart from the developing and frictional losses are entrance exit losses and you also have the bend losses. And if you want to see a, a complete value of the pressure drop that is from the inlet of the plenum to the exit. Uh, of the outlet manifold. So, then you also have to include the pressure drop right across the inlet plenum and also the outlet plenum. So, those also are not very small values because usually the length of these plenums are also usually large, correct? Because you are supplying fluid to so many of these micro channels. So, depending on the number of micro channels, the length of the inlet and outlet plenums also can be significantly large and therefore, these pressure losses within the plenum also will become important. Okay. So, therefore, in the case of micro channel, all the so called negligible pressure losses which you consider for a macro channel will become more significant such as the entrance losses, exit losses, bend losses. Okay and the pressure losses through the manifolds, all of this will become important. And therefore, when you um, calculate your pressure drop, you have to account for every small value which you might otherwise neglect. Okay. So, therefore, um, apart from your 4 times F apparent L by D, okay, this is within the channel, you also have bend losses which is given by this particular parameter called the loss coefficient due to bend. So, this k is your loss coefficient and similarly, you have loss coefficient due to constriction and expansion. So, that is at the inlet you have a constriction. So, there is a small vena contracta which is forming. Okay. So, there are constriction losses there and again when, when it is exiting you have a sudden expansion. So, there are also expansion losses. So, apart from therefore, this particular term you also have to account for the loss coefficients due to constriction expansion and the bend losses. So, therefore, the expression for pressure drop becomes uh, more complicated now with all these effects and you can also substitute for F apparent in terms of the Hagenbach factor and you will therefore, get at least 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 terms totally. Right? So, this is the expression that is generally used 
to estimate the pressure drop between the inlet and outlet of a micro channel. Okay. So, this still does not account for pressure loss in the manifold. So, this is as the figure shows only the pressure tappings here and here. Okay. If you are putting one pressure tapping here and one, uh, one here and one here, then that should account for the pressure losses in the manifolds as well. Okay. Okay. So, therefore, um, now if you look at the other important effect at micro, micro scale. So, as I said roughness becomes a very significant parameter. Okay. So, therefore, if you uh, take a microscope, uh, put the surface of this particular duct and then you see how the roughness looks. So, you will be looking at these are the microstructures of the roughness. So, therefore, um, just for the sake of investigation, you know uh, Satish Kandlikar uh, has classified several parameters for including this roughness effects. So, one is that uh, he has defined what is called as a floor okay, that is like a base from which all these roughness elements seem to be protruding. So, that is like a uh, you know foundation for the roughness. So, this is called the floor profile and then he estimates the average height of this roughness and he draws another set of these dashed lines here. So, this is called the mean roughness height. right? So, therefore, uh, one of the important uh, parameters that he characterizes is what is called the average maximum profile peak height. Okay? So, that is you measure from this mean profile what is the uh, distance from, from the maximum point of each roughness element to that mean and then you take the average of all these values. So, for example, you have for the first roughness element R p 1, <coughs> second one R p 2, R p 3 and so on and you take a simple arithmetic average and that will give you what is the average maximum profile peak height R p m. Okay. So, this is the maximum value of roughness okay. and you have to again since there is a variation between different roughness elements, you have to average them and that gives you an average value. So, this is one important parameter. The other important parameter is the pitch between the roughness. So, again if you take two roughness elements, the first two roughness elements, the separation distance is S m 1. Similarly, you have S m 2, S m 3 and so on you can take again an average arithmetic average and you have a mean spacing of profile irregularities. So, this is called as R S m. Okay. This is again an arithmetic average of the individual pitches. So, therefore, the equivalent roughness will be what? So, if you are measuring right from the floor so, this uh, distance of the mean profile from the floor is given by the distance F p and you have a average maximum profile peak at R p m and therefore, you can calculate what is the equivalent roughness as the summation of F p and R p m. Therefore, for any surface you can define what is F p, what is R p m you can calculate and therefore, from which you can estimate what is the equivalent roughness okay because you cannot be uh, choosy about going into the roughness equivalent roughness for each and every element you have to only define it for the average that's why we calculate the average for rp okay and we we know that fp is anyway more or less a constant because we take a, a baseline for the floor right and we just take the summation of rpm and fp and that gives you the the equivalent roughness and this equivalent roughness is what is used in many correlations where the friction factor or Nusselt number gets modified. Okay. So, now one of the simplest models that Kandlikar proposed, so any real channel, so the previous discussion is all for completely smooth channels where you do not have any difference in adapting the 
uh, friction factor, Nusselt number from macro to micro channel. But now, any real channel that you take will have this value of equivalent roughness and therefore, how do you see this effect? Now, friction factor will definitely go up. Okay? So, it is seeing a higher value of roughness, the pressure losses will be more. So, how this is to be accounted for into the existing correlation? So, Kahn-Likar proposed a very simple model for this. So, this is called the constricted flow model. So, all he assumed is that since you have calculated the equivalent roughness, you can assume that the diameter of the channel has now come down by the this much um, di uh, length or di this much dimensions. So, that is equivalent to 2 times epsilon. So, your actual diameter now or your constricted flow diameter is equal to your original diameter minus 2 times epsilon. So, the flow actually now sees a constricted dimension rather than the original dimension. Okay? So, if you propose a correction for the constricted diameter and still retain all the expression for friction factor and so on, the same expression, only replace your Reynolds number. In the original case, you have your d, you replace now with d c f. Okay? So, then it seems to be working quite good. So, if you for example, modify the Moody's chart. The original Moody's chart was based on the actual diameter d. You modify it based on the constricted flow diameter and you get a set of curves and apparently for all the micro channels, they seem to be matching very well with this modified Moody's chart. So, a very simple uh, model, but nevertheless very effective and accurate. So, all we have to only consider now is the constricted diameter. Okay? So, therefore, accordingly your definition of Reynolds number gets modified based on the constricted diameter and again the velocity also gets modified. Correct? So, originally the velocity was seeing a larger cross sectional area. Now, you have to calculate the constricted flow area okay, which will be smaller. Therefore, the velocity will now go up. Right? So, the definition of Reynolds number will be now based on the uh, velocity based on the constricted flow and also the diameter also will be the constricted flow diameter. And based on this, you still use the same um, friction factor which is dependent on the Poiseuil number. Okay, so, that remains the same only the values of u m and d h will become different and therefore, your pressure drop will become different. Okay. So, in the case of uh, micro channels with the roughness effects, so your pressure drop gets modified by replacing your velocity and your conventional velocity and diameter with the constricted flow diameter and the constricted velocity. So, other things still keep remaining the same. All right. So, we will stop here. I think uh, uh, tomorrow we will talk a little bit more about this um, effect of uh, constricted flow model and so on. So, I think we should be able to complete this uh, chapter. Okay, thank you.